Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. It was because of where he was. So sometimes God calls us just because of where we are. So now, we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 1. And, and what we're going to see here is that since the time of David, David was a pretty good king. He had his own faults. But since that time, that uh, what is that, like 240 years uh, from, from the time of David to this time of Isaiah, things have gotten way out of hand. You know, these kings that the nation of Israel wanted, that God didn't want them to have, they've steadily, things have steadily gotten worse. So Isaiah's going to paint a pretty grim picture here of what's going on in the nation of Israel. And quite honestly, when you read this, it sounds a lot like America, if the truth is told. So let's just read it. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, For the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord, They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They're utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. He's saying, listen, they're in a bad place. There's nothing good inside of them. Verse 6, from the sole of their foot to even their head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds... They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. He says these open wounds, they're not even caring for them. They're not even trying to fix the problem. Verse 7, your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Zion is left like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. He's talking about Jerusalem. We talked about this when we looked at David a couple of years ago. Zion is where God's presence dwells. Uh, in Jerusalem, when, when, when the temple was there, that was Zion. By the way, Zion is in us now. God's presence dwells in us, neither here nor there. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, in this very city where God's presence is supposed to dwell, it's a wreck. These people have forsaken God. They are chasing after all these things. It gets worse. Verse 9. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Now that's an interesting comparison. Think about how bad it was uh, for Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to your teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to, to me. New moon and Sabbaths and the calling of convocations I cannot endure. Uh, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead to the widow's cause. He says, listen, you're you're so disobedient, but you're still going through these ritual motions. You're still having these feasts. You're still making these sacrifices, but they don't mean anything because you have no devotion to God. You're just going through the motions, and he says, I hate it. 
Then we jump down to verse 21. This is pretty graphic. He says, How the faithful city has become a whore. She who is full of justice, righteousness lodged in her, but now murders. This very city that's supposed to have the presence of God, they have given themselves away to chase after other things. And you can see the comparison that he makes there. So, so here's the thing. With, with the situation here with Israel, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound good at all. And what happens is ultimately it gets a little worse. The Assyrians come in and, and try to conquer them. There's all these battles. Things are, things are not going great. God's people have rejected God in the very city that he gave them. Think about it. He called them out of Egypt. He rescued them. He kept them in the wilderness. He gave them this promised land by defeating Jericho, by defeating the Philistines. He gave them this land. And in the very land that he gave them, they have rebelled against him. <coughs> and now they're just going through the motions religiously, and they don't even care about God. And when we, when we look at humanity, we look at our country just as it is right now, there's a lot of similarities, is there not? You, you used to could say that we were a country that we were in God we trust. Well, now the government's trying to take that off of everything. We can't have God running around. We have parents who are at war with school boards because of what they're teaching our children. We've got all this stuff going on in our country, and we look at it, and we compare it to Israel, and we say, you know what? We're not much different. Even though God has blessed us as a country greater than, than any other country around, we find ourselves where we are in a position where we have forsaken God, just like Israel has. We have forsaken Him. And the situation seems hopeless. Right? If, if God said, I'm through with you, after reading that of the nation of Israel, we would say, yeah, I could see that. And if God looked at America and He said, hey, I'm, I'm through with you, what argument do we have? Not much, right? We've rejected God. And, and, and here's the thing for us. You know, we look at this with Israel and we say, man, how could they have fallen back like that? But the truth of the matter is we've done it too. And, and to be honest, we have the Spirit of God in us. We have a greater benefit than they had. And yet we find ourselves in this place so here we are, we look at this nation of Israel and we see a nation that needs a miracle, quite honestly. I mean, you look at this hopeless situation where they've re rebelled against God and he's basically said, you don't deserve anything. But there's hope. A nation that needs a miracle, just like America, there's hope. And it's even in this passage. I skipped over a couple of verses, let's read them. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So he will make us clean. He will cleanse us from our sin. He says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good food of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. There's this conditional statement there in verse 19. If you obey. If we are obedient. So what is that going to look like? Well, we're going to answer that. We're going to answer what obedience looks like. What is it that God is looking for from us? Because we talk about how we're saved by grace. It's not based on anything that we do. So how do those two tie together? We're going to see that today. What does it mean to be obedient. But we look at this, this deal that if, we're, if we don't obey, it says, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. There will be judgment. We look at what we just read about the nation of Israel. We look at the, what state our country is in. And if God judged us, we wouldn't be surprised, would we? So we need a miracle. So the rest of the book of Isaiah tells us what this miracle is that we need. When you get to Isaiah chapter 50, <clears throat> things have, have sort of gotten worse, if, you, if they can. And there's this heading in my Bible, and it says, Israel's sin and the servant's obedience. So in, in about Isaiah chapter 50, we're introduced to this servant that God is talking about. Actually, we're introduced to him in Isaiah chapter 9. I'll come back to that 
at the end. But we're introduced to this servant. So, so God's trying to tell us something about this position that we find ourselves in. What obedience looks like. How's he going to cleanse our sins? How's he going to accomplish all this stuff that he's going to accomplish through these nations that have rebelled against him? Well, let's pick it up in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 10. He said, Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? So here's our introduction to the servant. Who obeys the voice of the servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. This nation of Israel was walking in darkness, just like we in America sometimes we feel like we're walking in darkness. He says, listen, what you do is you trust in the Lord. Verse 11, Behold, all you who kindle a fire, who equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled. This you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Now let me tell you what he's doing here in these two verses. He's making a comparison, a contrast in comparison. Verse 10 is there are people who trust in the Lord. Verse 11 is there are people who light their own torches and try to find their own way. Do you see the comparison? Those who trust in the Lord will see salvation. Those who try to go at it their own way, they will see judgment. Right? So this is, he's setting the stage, talking about the servant. Jump over to chapter 51, verse 1. He says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, he explains it in verse 2. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. Now, what's he talking about there? He tells the nation of Israel, he says, listen, this idea about this servant, those who trust in the Lord, what's he talking about? He says, I want you to look back. I want you to look back when all this started, when I started the nation of Israel through Abraham. If you remember, when we looked at when Abraham uh, was called, there was a very important statement that we looked at. Do you remember what it was? God took Abraham outside. He had no children. And he said, if you look up at the stars in the sky, you'll, if you could count your offspring, they will be as the stars of the sky. Abraham was too old to have children. Sarah was too old to have children. They had never done it. And God said, if you'll put your faith in me and trust me, I'll do this for you. And you remember what it said? It says he believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. I told you when we studied that statement that it was going to be super important. Isaiah is pointing back to that moment that if you want to put your trust in the Lord, what you're doing is you're saying, I believe in God and it will be counted to me as righteous. I'm not going to go my own way. I'm not going to try to light my own torches and, and go my own path. I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. I'm going to remember how Abraham was saved. Read the rest of Isaiah 51. It's good stuff. Don't have time for that. Uh, <clears throat> Isaiah 52. So let's jump ahead. He says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Remember, he's talking about this servant. There's a servant, and he says, how good are the feet of the one who brings the good news. By the way, that passage is quoted in Romans 10, somewhere about verse 15, 16, somewhere in that range. And, and, and what they're talking about is this, that, that God has a message of salvation. That, that What we looked at in Isaiah chapter 1, and what we talked about in the state of America, is that there is hope. And it comes by way of a messenger who brings good news. Verse 8. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For, the eye, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has confronted, or comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Now think about... All the rebellion that Israel has done against God. And it says he is comforting them and he will redeem them. What does it mean to redeem? Well, it's about to be Christmas and you're probably going to get a gift card. When you take that gift card and you turn it in, you're redeeming it. You're paying for something. God is going to purchase us. 
in a certain way, and it has to do with this servant. Verse 10, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Now let me focus on this verse for just a moment. This good news is for Israel, right? You have rebelled against God. You've (coughs) forsaken God. You've chased after all these other things. And there's hope for you, Israel. But it's not just for Israel. See, this was God's plan all along. There's hope for the nations. And listen, best I can tell, none of us in here are Jewish. So he's talking to us right here. This is for us. That salvation is not just for the Jews. It's for us also. It's for the nations. This servant who comes is going to take the message of God, that God loves us and he died for us and he sent his son to die for us, to the nations. Remember, he told Abraham, through you I will bless the whole world world. This has always been part of God's plan. So now let's fast forward to chapter or verse 13 and we see more about this servant. He, he's going to tell us a little bit more about this servant that he's a suffering servant. Verse 13, behold my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of children of mankind. Jesus, when he was about to go to the cross, was beaten so bad, he didn't even look human. That's what this is talking about. His appearance was so marred. He, he looked like death, if you will. Verse 15, So shall he sprinkle many nations. Sprinkle them with what? The blood of Jesus Christ. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Now let's get to the good chapter. I said all that to get to here. That's the intro. Now we get to Isaiah chapter 53. If you didn't know any better, you would think this is in the New Testament. But it's not. Remember, written 760 years before Jesus. You don't think the Bible is true. You don't think the Bible is God-ordained. All this stuff points to Jesus. There's no way, apart from God, that this book is not real. Look at this. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed that he has heard from us? And whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Remember, when they chose Saul as their king, they chose the biggest, tallest guy. He looked the kingliest. But who did God use to defeat Goliath? A little shepherd boy, right? That his own family didn't even choose, which is symbolic of of Jesus. Think about this. Jesus' own family, his own brothers, didn't believe in him until after he rose from the dead. Right? The Jews missed it, right? Um, Verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. This servant is going to be stricken by God. There's more to that to come. But, but listen, this also says that he bore our griefs. Many people in our church have lost people in the last year or two, and we, we bear grief. We carry it. We can put that on him. He wants to help carry that grief for us. Verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's sin. Upon him was the chastisement or the punishment that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. See, we go back to this idea of, uh, of the first chapter of Isaiah and this rebellion, this rejection of God, this, uh, our sin that we have. God put it on him. He paid it for us. He struck him for us. The, the sin and stuff that we earned, God put it on On him, and by his wounds we are healed. Verse 6 All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, this suffering servant, the iniquity, the sin of us all. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. You remember when Jesus was standing before the, the Roman rulers and he was being tried. They were throwing out all these accusations. He didn't even respond. He just sat there. He opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. I want to take you to John chapter 1. <clears throat> In John chapter 1, John the Baptist's disciples, they're walking along and, and they see Jesus. You know what John the Baptist says? He says, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's who this is talking about. He's the Lamb. It's talking about Jesus. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. By the way, Jesus was uh, buried in a rich man's borrowed tomb. Verse 10, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring, and he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now let me stop right here. Verse 10. It was the will of the Lord to crush Jesus. This is why Jesus was silent. He didn't try to defend himself. This was the plan. That he goes and he dies for our sin. It was God's will to crush his son for you and for me. Now let that sink in. You want to know what Christmas is about? It's about the coming of this servant to die for our sins. And it was God's will to crush him. To, what, to take what we deserved, he put it on him. Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He hung on the cross with two other criminals. He was numbered with them, yet he bore the sin of many, and he makes intercession for the transgressors. Not only did he die on the cross, not only did he rise again, he sits at the right hand of God making intercession for you and I when we screw it up now. When we screw it up now, Jesus says, oh, don't worry, they're with me. They're one of mine. He's already paid for it. See, this is the thing about what Jesus Christ did for us. He didn't just pay for our past sins before we were saved. He knew what our sins would be in the future, and he paid for those too. It is finished, is what he said. So now, let's fast forward to Isaiah chapter 54. I want to show you this. Not only does Jesus die for our sins, not only does he make us white as snow, not only does he redeem us, Look at Isaiah 54, 5. For your maker, capital M, is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. We are part of God's family. Not only are our sins paid for, we become part of God's family. Look at verse 17 of that same chapter. He says, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall uh, succeed. And you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication from me declares the Lord. Let me tell you what this verse says. No matter what you've done in your past, no matter what that looks like, Nobody can run to God and say, hey, did you know what Tony Lee did? Did you know what Tyson Brewster did? Did you know what so-and-so did? Because he already knows and he already paid for it. Because if the accuser comes to God, you know what God's going to say? Paid for. It's done. Paid for. Don't come to me with that. It's been paid for. I put it on my son. It was my will to crush him, to pay for that. I'm going to ask TC and the band to come up here. Here's what I want us to think about before we go into this last song. 
This suffering servant that clearly points us to Jesus. No need to go to the New Testament because it's clearly about him. He paid for our sin. There's no balance left. No matter what we've done, God came to redeem us. In the midst of this great darkness that opens up in Isaiah chapter 1, we find great hope. The only hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a song called, O Come All You Faithful. And it's got this tag on the end of it. We're going to learn more about that here in just, just a minute. But I want you to stand. I want us to, to sing this song. This coming of this faithful servant. Right? The song is about, O Come and Check Him Out. Look at this servant. We think about Christmas. This is what it's about. You know, we look at this thing that he talked about in Isaiah and about how bad it was and how there was no hope. And I told you we were going to go back to Isaiah chapter 9 where we're introduced to this servant. And I'm going to read a verse. And you're going to say, that's a Christmas verse. It is. 700 plus years before Jesus they were trying to tell us that there's hope coming. And here it is, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. That's Jesus. He's the light of the world. It says, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. He carries our burden. He, we put our burden on him. He leads us with the staff of a shepherd. He protects us because he's the good shepherd. Verse 5 talks about how there will be peace. And then we get to verse 6. And it says, For to us a child is born. To us. A son is given. This suffering servant that comes for us comes in the form of a baby. We celebrate that on Christmas. And it says, The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That is who we put our faith in. We talk about this idea of obedience. And what does it mean to be obedient? It means to put our trust and our faith in this suffering servant. He said, if you are thirsty, come to me and I will give you living water. That's what it means to be obedient. is to not try to do it on your own, but to give it to him. Would you give it to him today? Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. There's no better time than right here at the Christmas season than to put your faith and trust in him. And if you're here today and you're a Christian, what does this mean for us? Man, we should worship like nobody's ever worshipped before. And the great part of this is the song's not over. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church. Please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel. Just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us. We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.